Hi, so I want to prove the, the Cook-Levin theorem, which is one of the most important theorems in all of complexity theory, which is the fact that SAT is NP-complete. So SAT was the problem of all Boolean formulas, and we want to figure out whether they're satisfiable or not. And we introduced NP-complete, which is the problems that are the hardest problem in NP. And I want to show that this is uh, true. So remember that NP-complete means that it's both in NP and it's also NP hard. So we've already shown that SAT is in NP and, and the reasoning comes from, you can just have the certificate be the satisfying assignment and then just verify whether that really is a satisfying assignment. So then the hard part of the proof, and hopefully I can do this in one take, <laughs> is that this problem is NP hard and I want to show that it is NP hard. So what does NP-hard mean? So NP-hard, what that meant was that for all B in NP, we have that B poly reduces to SAT. So whatever problem in NP you got, you can poly reduce it to SAT and have the answer for whether the formula is satisfiable if and only if the original input was in the language uh, B. So the problem is, well, there are infinitely many different languages in NP, and I, I could try a few of them and then and poly reduce them to SAT, but the problem is that that would take an infinite amount of time, and I know that there's an infinite, uh, finite amount of storage on YouTube servers, so I can't actually do that. But we can notice something interesting, which is uh, that B is an NP. So that's the only information that we have about uh, B. So uh, what can we use with this? Well, we know that uh, B has a, a poly time, a non-deterministic Turing machine for it, because that's what it means to be an NP. Or, I mean, you could define it in terms of certificates, but it actually turns out to be easier for this theorem to prove uh, from the non-deterministic Turing machine's point of view. So what we can do is uh, remember that NP, uh, not NP hard, what the reduction here says that W is in B if and only if F of W is in SAT. That's what it means to um, do the poly time reduction and make sure that the reduction takes polynomial time, but we'll get to that. The reduction here, what do we need to do? We need to take something that a non-deterministic Turing machine does, and we need to output a formula, a Boolean formula. So let's encode the machine as the formula. So the formula is going to encode what the Turing machine would have done, and we'll have it such that the formula is satisfiable if and only if the Turing machine has some way of accepting the input. <laughs> So it's a roundabout way of simulating the Turing machine, but as long as we can do it in polynomial time, we are all good. So I want to introduce something called a uh, tableau. So the reason we want to introduce a tableau is to get the intuition right. Um, the reduction and the formula have nothing to do with the table or tableau or whatever, but it's just to get the uh, intuition right. So Let's think about what the tableau is. So it's a giant table, which has a bunch of cells in it. So let's, let's try to make this look reasonably good. So something like this. Okay, and maybe I'll draw a few more lines to make this more interesting. Okay. So what does it mean to have a non-deterministic uh, uh, polynomial time Turing machine? Well, the Turing machine we know runs in some polynomial amount of time. So let's say uh, runs in big O of n to the k time for some number k. That's all we know. Well, then what we can do is let's encode into this table the configurations of the Turing machine. So the 
the rows here are going to be the configs of the Turing machine. So starting with the first one, then the second one, then the third one, all the way down into the very last one. So, so the first one's obviously the first configuration, and we know what that starts out with. And then the very last one is going to be the n to the kth uh, one. And, and maybe uh, we'll have to put a constant here because the, we're hiding the constant here. It's not that important here because we're just going to encode the rules of the Turing machine into the formula. It doesn't have like um, the specific uh, running time, although we can put that into the formula later anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this. So the left column is going to have pound signs all the way down. So pound signs all the way down. And the very last column is also going to have pound signs all the way down. So hopefully this looks reasonable. So then what are we going to do in the middle? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with you can think of each of these cells as the cells on the tape at each point. So this is the right before any transitions occur. The second row is when one transition occurred. The second one is the second transition occurred and etc. So the first row is obviously going to be Q0, W1, W2, W3, up to Wn. And the rest of the tape is going to be blank symbols because n to the k might be way bigger than the input size, so the rest of the tape is going to be blanks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to encode all of the transitions of the Turing machine. So we're going to encode the transitions of that Turing machine, and we'll see how to do that. But the basic idea is think about this table. So here, because we have n to the k, well, what, how big, wide, how wide should this table be? It'll turn out that we will need, uh, at most, big O n to the k uh, columns. Because if the Turing machine just happened to move right on every single iteration, then that means that um, when we hit the, the limit of how far we can go in terms of time, then that means at most we'll be in this cell way over here. So it's likely that this cell will have a blank in it, but we'll never need more than that because we're going to encode into the formula. Um, you can't go past this cell because um, we're, we know how long the Turing machine runs. So that's all that we need to do. So in fact, this table is pretty much a square. Maybe not exactly because we have these two extras right here, but you can make it so that it's a square also. So it's not necessarily that important that it's a square, but you can think of it like one. Okay, so what we need to do is to uh, make a formula that represents all of this stuff in the table. And we need to make sure that the the configurations start out correctly, end correctly, and um, each of the rows will yield the next one. So remember computation histories is each of the configurations uh, yields the next one. So here are our, our goals for the formula. So the goals for the formula. So the first one is actually not one that I've said, but is also important that each entry has exactly one value, okay? That may not seem important right now because it seems totally obvious that there could only be one entry in each, uh, one value in each entry, but we have to uh, account for that and we'll see why when we start working with the formula. Uh, the second step is to ensure the first row is the starting config. The third is that the last row is the uh, accepting. It, it could be any accepting configuration. So as long as it has the Q accept state somewhere in there, we are all good. And then the fourth one is that each row yields the next. Okay, so those are the goals of the formula. And then 
what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a little formula phi one, phi two, phi three, and phi four for that encode each one of these constraints and then the whole formula let's call it uh, phi is going to be the and of all of these it's called the conjunction of the four so it's going to be phi one and phi two and phi three and phi four okay so then all that we need to do is let's we got to make each one of these formulas and, and it really is that simple so now let's just focus on each of the formulas in turn and then we are totally done it's, uh, assuming that it takes polynomial time so let's do phi one so that says that each entry has exactly one value well before we even do that we got to actually encode each of the variables of the formula so each of the entries in this table can be um, can be a state. It could be the blank symbol. It can be any of the input characters or any of the tape characters. It could be a blank symbol. So any of those possibilities are true. So what we're going to do is we're going to encode all the possibilities of not only the row that we can be in, but also the column that we can be in and every value that can appear in any of the value uh, positions, we're gonna encode them as variables. So the variables are going to be, uh, I'm gonna call them X sub I, J, and S. So here, the I is gonna encode the row. So this one, this variable happens to be row I. Uh, this is gonna be in column J. So the second thing is for the column. And then the third one is the value at that position. Okay, so the reason why we need to uh, work with phi one here to have exactly one value is we could in principle say x zero zero uh, blank um, is set to true and x zero zero uh, q zero is also true. So that's just saying in the position zero zero, we have the blank and Q0 set to true. So the, the, that's the problem with this, which is that you could theoretically have two things uh, both be true, even if you don't want them to be true. Because these are just variables, they're true and false. They're, the true and false setting are independent of each other, whereas in the, in, the pic, in the picture, they're not independent. So we gotta work with phi one here, to ensure that they really are forced in some sense to be um, dependent on each other. They're not really dependent, but in the sense of satisfying the formula, they are dependent on each other. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we gotta make sure that each of the entries has exactly one value, so phi one. So we need to do an and over all the entries across the entire table from the first row all the way down first column all the way over so we need to do a giant and from uh between for the row between one and n to the k and the column between one and n to the k and then now we have to put into here some way of saying uh, entry I and J has exactly one value. So instead of focusing on the entire formula, right, uh, sorry, the entire tableau, we're gonna focus on a specific entry right here. And we're gonna ensure that that one entry has exactly one value. So uh, this is a lot easier than thinking about the whole table. So the way to encode exactly one value is it has at least one value and cannot have two values. So that's how we're going to encode this. So the two things we're gonna have are at least one value and uh, cannot have uh, two values. Okay, so then if we think about three values, well, <laughs> that means it has two values, which means that it cannot be possible. So. How do you encode the at least one value thing? Well, what you do is just say, I'm gonna or over all possible values because anything could be set at this particular entry in principle. 
So for this one, we're going to have a giant or over all possible, uh, let's see, so we're going to have uh, from S up to, let's say, V, uh, maybe a different letter, let's say Z, where I'm going to note, take here that Z is the, uh, actually, I'll, I'll do it a different way. So let's say that Z is the set of all characters that can be placed anywhere. So pound signs, take characters, everything, uh, including states, everything. So that's the set of all characters. And then we will have that, we will look at every single one of those and then say, I'm going to have uh, the variable X, I, J, and S right there. So this is saying um, at, at least one of these has to be true. At least one thing is set there because if none of these variables are true, then this whole thing will be false. And then the way that we're going to code the rest is that the thing inside the orange box here is false. And so the giant and here is going to be false. And then the whole formula is going to be false. So it's kind of, it's kind of cascading all the way through. So then how do you encode uh, not two values? So I'm going to put an and right here. And this is a common trick if you uh, work in this kind of area, where what you do is you iterate over all pairs of possible different values and ensure that it can't be the case that both of them are set. So I'm going to put a giant and right here and uh, loop over all S and T in this set Z of all characters, such that S is not equal to T. So two different values here. And then what we're going to put is a little, little tiny formula right here, which is saying it can't be the case that uh, I, J is set to S or it's not X, I, J, T either. Make sure that it appears on the screen. So let's, let's go through this. So suppose that um, this position is set to S and T. Well, then that means that this is true and this is true. So that means that the negation on both of them is false, which means that this little yellow clause right here is false. So, so this is a clause whenever you have something or something or something or whatever. So this is a little thing. This little part is false. We have a giant and right here, which is going to evaluate to false. This and right here will ensure that everything inside the orange box is false. And so then the entire formula is false if this entry is set to two different values. So that means that we can't have two values in the same position. <laughs> so you must have at least one position, uh, one value in this position, and you can't have two values in this position. Cool. And uh, one thing that we'll immediately note is that phi1 is of polynomial size in the original uh, Turing machine, or the input, I should say. And the reason for that is that this giant and right here is n to the 2k, so a polynomial, and it, so n to the 2k different uh, orange boxes here. And on the inside, we have um, a linear in the number of, of the characters, the number of characters. And then this one is quadratic in the number of characters. So again, another polynomial times another polynomial. It's a big polynomial, but it's still polynomial. Okay. So then this formula is a polynomial size. It remains to see that the other formulas are polynomial size, but certainly this one is. Okay. So then, th so that's phi one. And then now we got to ensure that the first row is the um, correct uh, starting config. So let's start the uh, first row off right. So phi 2 is the first row. Well, remember what the first row said. It had a uh, pound sign Q0, W1, W2, up to Wn, blank, a bunch of blanks, and then the final pound sign at the end. So, the re so what do we actually do here? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say 
oh, the first row in the first position is pound sign, the first row in the second position is Q0, and then just carry on all the way through. So what is phi2 going to be? It's going to be uh, x sub, and I'm going to in index it at 1. Uh, you, but you can do it at 0, it doesn't really matter. So the first position has to be a pound sign. And then and, the next position, so the first row again, but the second position is going to be Q0. And then and x1, 3, w1, and etc. And let's just get the notation right. So I think wn will be at the n plus tooth position. So we'll have x1, uh, n plus 2, wn. And then we got to hit the blanks after that. So we get x1, n plus 3, blank, and etc. And then what we'll get is that this very last one is n to the k, let's say. And then what we'll have is that the last blank is at n to the k minus 1. So we'll have uh, here x1, n to the k minus 1, blank, and x1, n to the k, pound sign. And that's just encoding the first row. So that's pretty easy. Uh, so then what do we actually uh, do here? So we got the first row done. Now we have taken care of phi2. Oh, I went too far. So phi2 is good. So we got the starting config. Now we got to do the last row. So here, uh, what we need to do is, oh, we also have to make sure that this is polynomial in size, but that's pretty easy to do because there are only n to the k different variables being presented here. So that's clearly a polynomial. All right. So then now we get to do phi 3, which is the last row is accepting. Then all we need to do is to ensure that there's a q except somewhere in this in, in the entire uh, last row somewhere. So this is actually really easy. So it's just the big or of it could be in any of the positions. Okay. So uh, in, in fact, one thing that we'll note here is that because the Turing machine runs in at most n to the k time, look at the tableau. So it could theoretically be that we stop halfway through, right? Or, or even way earlier or way later. I don't know where the accept is, but it's somewhere in this gigantic table somewhere. And if we encode the next thing, which says that each row yields the next one successfully, then we will be able to handle this uh, completely uh, by saying that the Q accept can just appear anywhere. It doesn't have to be in the last row. Um, but it's not just that the last row is accepting, but the last row of the Turing machine actually running is accepting. So we can actually just iterate over the entire table and just see if there's a Q except somewhere. So we're going to do the same trick that we did for phi 1 and just iterate over all i and j, all possible indices, and then just say, is f at i j is Q except at that position? And that's easy to do. And, and clearly this runs in a polynomial amount, amount of time because it's even smaller than the first formula that we did. <laughs> and that's polynomial too. So uh, we're good here. So then now we got to do the hard one, so to speak, which is 5, 4, which is that each row yields the next row. Okay. So uh, what are we going to do here? So what we... What we should do is like let's pull up two rows because if we're focused on each row yielding the next one then uh if one row doesn't yield the next one then it doesn't matter what happens the rest of the machine so let's just focus on two consecutive rows which is what we have right here so let's say that we have uh i don't know a b so this might not be the entire row, this is just uh, a picture. C, and then let's say the state QI is right here, looking at, let's say, a B, C, C, and then A, B, C, or whatever. 
So note what happens. So no matter what happens, the Turing machine either moves right or moves left. So let's just say, for example, that this machine moves left. It maybe goes to QJ. Maybe it changes this cell to be a D. So then this position will be a D. Well, this, every other entry of this entire row other than this one, and where the, uh, and maybe in this little uh, window right here, so to speak, the rest of the row is exactly the same. So here, the A and B at the front are the same. The C from before moved up because the, the state moved left. So here we're going to put the same C. Th these two C's are the same. And then all the other entries are going to be exactly the same. So the only thing we really need to encode is uh, what happens right here. So I'm going to put it in red, this part right here. Okay. So what we're going to say here is that this, this little red box right here is a two by three uh, window because it looks like a little window. But the rest of the rows look exactly the same apart from uh, these uh, two by three windows. And what can we do here? Well, the only thing that can possibly happen here are the uh, are a valid transition of the machine. That's all that can possibly happen. So what we can do here, so I'm not going to write out exactly what happens here because it depends on the Turing machine. So it's going to be, uh, so it's going to encode um, uh, row i, row i, and row i plus 1 being the same except for a a two by three window, which encodes a valid transition. And we have to uh, make sure that the transition is valid from this state looking at that symbol. Be the, it's a non-deterministic machine, so it may have choices, but it has to be a valid transition of some kind somewhere. Um, and, we'll, and we also need to ensure that not for a 2 by 3 window, but exactly 1. And we've done the exactly 1 condition already. So you say it's at least 1 and it can't have 2. And the rest of the rows, the ex these rows right here, are exactly the same. And then we and over all i. Okay? So we and over all possible uh, choices of i. So from 1 to n to the k minus 1, because um, it's looking at the next row, because there are n to the k rows. But it's, it's anding over all the possibilities here. Note that this is a polynomial, so I want to prove that it's polynomial. So here, the total, the number of possible windows is going to be at most, well, what's the, the most possibilities? Well, here, the number of possible things that could appear here, and you have to verify this for moving right also, but it's exactly this very similar analysis. So here we could have three different symbols possibly. So that is at most the size of the symbol set cubed uh, times the number of states in the Turing machine because any state could theoretically appear here. But clearly <laughs> this is at most a polynomial because this is at most the input size and uh, this is um, certainly a polynomial in the Turing machine size. So, so in fact, we're good here. And then uh, what are the possible things here? Well, the rest of the row, you may think, okay, well, uh, I have to multiply all the possibilities across all of these. Well, we actually don't need to because we can encode that the window can start here, start here, start here, start here, all the way through, and then just ensure that whatever appears here appears here. 
So we just need to multiply, um, it, it, so, yeah, so whatever's here, we can encode that this bottom entry right below it is exactly the same. And in fact, you can do that independently of what the entry actually is. So uh, I would leave that as an exercise to do. So you would say that um, the top row, whatever's at the top row implies the thing at the bottom row and vice versa. And that's pretty easy to do uh, with a Boolean formula. I'll leave it as an exercise. So, so 5.4 is also a polynomial size formula here. And it will, so this is really encoding all of the different transitions of the Turing machine. And so therefore we have shown that uh, we can actually build this gi ginormous, but still polynomial size formula, no matter what the Turing machine is, as long as it runs a non-deterministic polynomial time. And so by this lengthy analysis, we are able to show, uh, which is what the kuchel theorem says, that any language in NP polynomial time reduces to satisfiability. And so therefore, sat is NP hard, and we already know it's in NP. So therefore, sat is NP complete. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about the Cook-Levin theorem down into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching this incredibly long video, and I'll see you next time.